Mr. Sherwood, last year uh, your company signed a deal for $35 million with the Burmese regime. What does that involve? Well, it's basically an investment in uh, ships and shore facilities for the development of river uh, tourism in Burma. Did you consider all the implications of Burma's rather appalling record as far as human rights are concerned before you went in with this project? Before you went in with this project? Well, I, I did, and I've uh, tried to investigate uh, these allegations about human rights infringements. It's very hard to, uh, to pin them down. People make these accusations or allegations. Mm. I immediately try to see if there's any proof uh, to them. I can't find it, but of course I accept that I uh, cannot visit all of Burma and I, uh, my uh, visits are limited to the principal cities, so, uh, so perhaps that's uh, um, I, out of sight, out of mind uh, attitude. Yeah. So I, I, can't, I can't speak any further than my personal knowledge. Did you make really any attempt before you invested in Burma to see this other side? Well, what I did do was that I uh, contacted uh, the senior CIA uh, representative uh, uh, for Burma and um, uh, had the extensive discussions about the truth of all of these allegations. And he confirmed to me that, uh, uh, that they were all untrue or that to the degree that they occurred, they were related to the drugs war. So um, then, the, they're not allegations. I mean, here the, the, I mean, you would think that the United Nations, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, uh, uh, the United States government, the United States State Department says, for instance, forced labor is routine in Burma. Um, I don't think these all come into the realm of allegations. There's well, a great deal of substance there, surely. Well, perhaps you, you can say so, but I don't have any personal evidence of it. I, um, Did you see the, the elected leader of the country, Aung San Suu Kyi, when you were there? No, I didn't, no. I think it would uh, be inappropriate or uh, untactful for us to uh, uh, open a dialogue with, uh, with the opposition leader. Uh, but I mean, she's the elected all, leader. Um, some would say that the people uh, uh, the generals that you saw are the opposition. Well, I, I believe that the generals are in power. <laughs> the general's power is backed by foreign money. One estimate is that since it crushed democracy in 1990, the Burmese regime has drawn 65% of its financial support from oil companies. The main backers are the French company Total and its American partner, Unical. The oil pipeline they are building in the south of Burma will allow the generals to sell the country's natural gas to Thailand. The deal will give them an estimated $400 million a year over 30 years. And the British are back. Last December, a London Chamber of Commerce seminar was told about the real visionaries in the Burmese government. And in the House of Commons, the Foreign Office Minister, Jeremy Hanley, made this remarkable statement. Through commercial contacts with democratic nations such as Britain, the Burmese people will gain experience of democratic principles. Of course, just as the peoples of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Indonesia, and all the other modern tyrannies have gained experience of the democratic virtues of British business. If the opposite wasn't true, this would be funny. We repeatedly asked ministers at the Foreign Office and the Department of Trade in London to be interviewed for this film, but they refused. So did the Burmese Embassy. We can reveal that one British company that did trade with the Rangoon regime was the arms company BMARC. BMARC was a subsidiary of Astra, whose chairman was Gerald James. It became apparent uh as we investigated BMARC's affairs uh, after we took it over, that they were running a secret order book mm -hmm. and also conducting other covert operations on behalf of the intelligence community. What evidence do you have that, um, that BMARC did ship arms to Burma? Well, here, here you have a list with several countries on, including uh, Burma. Mm -hmm. And what is this document? Well, that document emerged when, under great pressure, the receiver 
was forced by Sir Richard Scott, who threatened him with a court order, to disclose information to me. So this is this, in fact, is a byproduct of the Scott investigation. That's correct. Yeah. I see the sales to Burma were in 1990. That was two years after the military regime cracked down there. And so arms arriving at that time would have been quite significant. Yes, I, I should imagine it would have been uh, very significant. But the British government have made clear since 1988 that they would not grant licenses for the export of arms to Burma. Yes, but I mean, the British um, government denied a lot of uh, things, but in the end it's turned out to be a pack of lies. Like Britain and America, Australia has pursued a double-faced policy. While the government condemned human rights abuses, the former Prime Minister Bob Hawke led a trade mission to Rangoon. We had been uniformly impressed by the competence, knowledge and commitment of these ministers and their associates to the economic development of Myanmar as a basis for the national and political advancement of the people of their country. I think if you investigate the situation, you will find that the so-called open market economy that exists at this moment is only open to some and not to everybody. Yes, well, the other day another Australian politician, uh, Mr Fisher, said that Burma is heading towards democracy, therefore investment is uh, absolutely justifiable. I mean, what, what do you say to uh, Well, like it, an adjustment is not justifiable now. Mm. But I am convinced that Burma is heading for democracy because of what the people want and because of what all those who want democracy are doing. Yeah. And not, not because of the investors investing or for any other reason. Japan is another big investor. Playing its part is the Japanese national broadcasting company NHK, which is proud of its impartiality. NHK owns some of the only TV film of the killings in 1988. When we asked to purchase this, we got the following reply. Unfortunately, it is NHK's policy that the footage showing the Burmese army shooting citizens who demonstrated cannot be used by anybody in the world because it's too delicate and might threaten Myanmar's stability. Please erase the material in your library. I appreciate your understanding the situation. With our film smuggled out, we flew to Thailand and crossed the Burmese border into a liberated area held by the Karen, one of Burma's ethnic peoples who have been fighting for autonomy for more than 40 years. The presence of these undefeated people enjoying a guarded freedom in their own land demonstrates that until there is democracy and perhaps a federation of all of Burma's peoples, there will never be peace. When I ask people in Rangoon if 1988 could happen again, if there could be another uprising, I was told this. Imagine a zebra crossing. The traffic never seems to stop for the pedestrians. One or two dart across. The majority wait impatiently at the curb. Then they surge across until the traffic has lost all its power. We, the Burmese people, are back at the curb now, waiting impatiently. In many ways, Burma is typical of poor countries where foreign investment and tourism have become the triggers for so-called development and economic growth. What this usually means is that those at the top get rich while the majority end up in sweatshops and that autocrats and dictators gain a false respectability by embracing the so-called free market. In Asia, the result of this is a vast expanding pool of cheap labor from China to Indonesia, and now with the prospect of Burma undercutting them all. This is another side of the Asian economic miracle that you seldom read about on the business pages. Backed by the power of foreign capital and the power of tourism, it gives a gloss to essentially brutal policies. In other words, it normalizes the unspeakable. This was how the apartheid regime in South Africa lasted for as long as it did. Sanctions, not profits, helped to bring it down. At the height of their epic struggle in 1988, 
the people of Burma produced a genuine popular democracy, then legalized it with an overwhelming vote. For this act of principle and courage, they paid a terrible price. They deserve more than our complicity and silence.